I'm Dr. Jeff Kaplan, and for over 30 years I've traveled the globe from Dubai to Moscow and Johannesburg, from Singapore to Shanghai and Istanbul. I've studied the world's best businesses and the people that run them. But something is very different now. From the boardroom to the break room, there's a growing realization that our relationship with work is broken. But it's not too late. You still have a choice. Hold on to the past and struggle to survive or join the willing, change, and thrive in the world of tomorrow that's already arrived. So if you're willing, willing to think different, willing to work different, willing to change at the speed of now, then you're willing to win. Welcome to a very exciting episode of Willing to Win. I'm Jeff Kaplan, and with us as always is my friend and co-host, Tara Thomas Getman. Hi everyone, hey Jeff, thanks for having me. You know, willing to win this conversation, it's been going on for years. Talk about the history. Yeah, it's, it's so, so exciting, Tara. Um, certainly we've got people uh, that are joining this conversation either with the radio show or our television show, but the, the, the very beginning of this dates back all the way to 1970, uh, when a book was issued uh, by a man named Alvin Toffler. Alvin Toffler wrote this book called Future Shock, and in it, he described a world that was gonna be quite different than the one we all knew. Now, I was far too young to read the book at the time, but a decade and a half later, when I was old enough to pick it up and read it, it still resonated with me because of one particular theory he had in the book, which was something that said that the world that we knew was gonna change. It promised a whole new world that was unlike anything that we had seen before. And his theory is really simple. If you take all the time that uh, we have been on this planet as humans and stood upright and, and are recognized as the species that we are today, um, that's been about 50,000 years. And if you consider that each person or each generation lived for an average of about 62 years, um, then you can say that there's been 800 lifetimes, right? You take you know, 62 years and you divide that into 50,000, comes out to 800. The reason why that's so important is if you just imagine in your mind that number line from zero to 800 representing all the time that we've been here, you could start to understand the big points in history that changed everything. You see, for the first 650 generations, we lived in caves and didn't even communicate from generation to generation, which means every time there was a new generation, we had to learn everything all over again. In fact, it's only been in the last 70 generations that uh, one generation has been able to communicate effectively with the next generation. And interestingly, we have to go all the way then from 70 to six generations. It's only been in the last six generations that a wide variety of people have seen the written word, not read, but seen the written word in their lifetime. And it's only been in the last four generations that we've had the use of the electric motor. And, and that's changed everything. But the big change happened in the 1950s when the United States became the first world power to use less than 50% of its population to make its nation's food. Now, why is this so important? It's so important because it freed people up from being out on the farm to doing other things, to have other pursuits. And with that, we had an explosion of technology. We had an explosion of this thing called change and organizations and careers and families that were once built to last, all of a sudden were built for change. And today, we are starting to see his prophecy, his belief that change would be the primary characteristic of the future. We're starting to see that all come to life. We are in a world right now where every single day is un unpredictable, right? It's, it's unanticipated. We see it in the news all the time. So we need to build organizations. We need to build careers. We need to build relationships that are built for that change. As a matter of fact, our work is centered on the belief that our relationship with work is completely broken because of this change. And in order to repair our relationship with work, we really need to repair five unique relationships. The first being our relationships with how we get things done in organizations. I don't know about you, but most of the people that I work with are not super excited about the way their organizations run. We need to find different ways to do that in the future. Additionally, we need to change our relationship with what we value. Money um, you know, is not the primary 
primary source of value going forward. There's a whole litany of new opportunities to create value in new ways using technology, and we need to explore that. We also need to change our relationship with our customers and we need to change our relationship with our careers. If you're in a career right now and you are depending on your organization to put you into a development program and to help you rise up in your organization and get a leadership role, well think again because organizations are not doing that anymore. We have to take control of our own careers. And finally, and most importantly, we have to change our relationship with each other. And I think that's what uh, we're, we're all about here at Willing to Win. This is so exciting and we want to hear more. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with your questions. Willing to Win, Jeff Kaplan, right after this. Hey there, early risers, go-getters, all-nighters, and in-betweeners. Today is a new day. It's time to move and reclaim your routine. And if pain is holding you back, the Joint Chiropractic can help with our $29 new patient special, including consultation, exam, and adjustment. Visit thejoint.com today and reclaim your routine. The Joint Chiropractic, you're back, baby. Hi, and welcome back. I'm Jeff Kaplan. And I'm Tara Thomas-Gentman. Thanks for staying with our first episode of Willing to Win. For years, Jeff, you've talked to thousands, tens of thousands of professionals all across the world. In fact, Melissa, a friend from Tampa, Florida that has followed you all these years and believes in the mis mission and message behind Willing to Win, she wants to know how do you take charge of your career, especially for those folks that are sort of mid-career in their journey? Hi, Jeff. It's Melissa from Tampa. I have a great question for you. How does someone who is mid-career pause, stop, and take it to the next level. Melissa, it's so great that uh, you're still part of the conversation and I really appreciate you sending, sending in this question. Uh, and, I, and I will say that, you know, taking charge of your career is an absolutely critical aspect for anyone that's working today. Whether you're just starting out and you wanna get that first job, you're mid-career, or you're an executive that's trying to get the most out of that uh, top level opportunity. Because if you approach it the way that, um, most people have traditionally, they believe that they go to an organization, you know, right out of school and they get hired in. And then it's sort of like 40 years of you know, show up, shut up and do it our way. And we'll give you a gold watch and a pension, right? Well, we know the pensions are gone. The gold watch is gone. And very, very few people are in a career for 40 years. As a matter of fact, the length of a career is shortening and shortening with each passing decade. And I will tell you, it's interesting because for my grandparents, um, in their careers, they were flighty if they had three or, or, or maybe even four jobs, right? But, but today, the average worker um, that's graduating college is gonna have 12 plus jobs in their career. So you're not gonna be around long enough to be in a program um, that's gonna drive your career for you. So you're gonna have to take charge of that yourself. And it reminds me of, uh, of a story uh, that, that really brought this home to me. Uh, when I was in my doctoral program, there's, there's two parts to it. The first part, which is the normal classwork you do just like in any other you know, high school or college experience. But the second half of your doctoral program, you write your dissertation and you do it alone. So this was the night uh, between those two. It's the last night that I was with my learning team before we were gonna go off and, and do this activity on our own. And, and that's when somebody asked the whole team a very interesting question. They said, why are you here getting your doctoral degree, right? It's, it's expensive, 70, $80,000, the divorce Divorce rate amongst people that get postgraduate degrees is over 50% because there's so much pressure. Why were we here? And when I heard that question, a chill <laughs> went down my spine because I had never really thought about that, right? Because I, at that point, had been living my life like I was riding a bus, right? I would just get on in certain points, right? You get on and you go to junior high, right? You're like, the, the bus is about to drop you off at junior high, and you think, oh, I can't do this. I, I can't compete at this level. They're bigger than me. I have no reason, you know, to be here. But somehow you make it through, you get back on the bus, you go to high school, and you repeat the process, and if you maybe choose to go to college or start your career, and the same thing happens again and again. The bus takes you to that next 
next destination, right? What we need to do is we need to figure out how to stop riding that bus and start driving that bus. And so when it came to me, I really didn't have an answer as to why I had made the investment, you know, in, in pursuing this degree. But what came out of, uh, you know, my response that came from me surprised even me at the time. I, I looked around the room and I said, the reason that I'm in this program is because the only time I ever saw my father cry. Now, my, my father was a, a salesman, an in-home seller. He had a high school education. We didn't have any traditional bank account. Our bank account was his front right pocket, and our savings account was a, was a jar of, 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 of change that was on a, a table. And that's how I knew how well we were doing. If there was lots of silver in that jar, we were okay. And if we were down just to the, the copper pennies, we'd probably need to move that next month. But the one thing this guy had, the one thing this guy had was his sales ability. He was so proud that he was still able to provide for his family with that sales ability. But he was told by his boss when he was having a, you know, a dry spell for a few weeks, he was told by his boss he wasn't worth his draw. And when he retold that story to my mother and me, I, it was the only time I ever saw him cry. And I'm not, I don't remember that because seeing a man cry is such a, uh, you know, uh, a thing that was so impactful. But it was, it was what went on around that. I saw someone's self-identity crumble before me. And I thought right then, I thought right then, work should never, ever have this kind of control over an individual. And I set my sights on creating a career where we can make it better. And that's really what this is all about. What a great message. And I love, like for so many of us, that feeling of, are we in control of our futures? Are we taking charge of our careers? Or is it the other way around? Thanks so much, Melissa in Florida, for asking that question. Thanks, Melissa. Hi, Jeff. This is Juritzin from Belgium. And I wonder, how do you take charge of your career when you are a young person? Wow. Juritzin in Brussels, Belgium. One more example of your worldwide reach with your message that truly is connecting with so many people. You know, we have been working with college students for, for about 15 years, and over 50,000 students have been in one or another of our programs during that time. So we have a lot of experience with young people that are struggling with the idea of what are they going to become post degree, right? So the first thing we want to give as a, as a piece of advice, if you know a young person, is not to wait until you're a senior. And don't worry, if you're a senior listening to this, we've got some things you can do there too. But if you have the opportunity and you're in those first three years of your college experience, start to build up your, your, your strategy then, so that by the time you graduate, you're just going to the job that you knew you were gonna get two years before. So it's a seamless transition. And, and that may seem like um, something that is really hard to do, but it's not. And we're gonna explain how to get to that point using some basic techniques. Because if you don't use these techniques, your, your alternative is to do what we've been doing for years and years, and it really makes no sense. And you think about it, right? Is that, you know, think about the day that you were born. The, the, the day, the month, and the year you were born, you came into this world, right? You open up your eyes and you start having experiences. Now these experiences are like no other person on the planet in the history of our species. They're absolutely unique experiences. And now you're 18, 19, 20 years old, and you have 18, 19, 20 years worth of unique experiences. That's an amazing asset. That's the asset that you bring to your professional life. Now, what do you do with that? Well, the current process says you reduce all of that uniqueness into a sameness. You take all of that uniqueness and you put it on an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, call it a resume and get in line at a job fair. And you hand out your resume to potential employer after potential employer, and then you tell them what makes you can unique, which includes your GPA um, and your extracurricular activities and the fact that you are really enthusiastic and uh, should be a part of the team. Uh, but there's nothing that happens in that process that would allow somebody to really stand out and be that unique individual that they are. So instead, what we suggest is you take a different approach, right? You don't let your career 
choose you because that's what you're doing you're getting in that line you're handing out your resumes and you're hoping that someone picks your sheet of paper out of a stack of similar sheets of paper and 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 gives you this career and that when you get there everything's going to be great and let me just dispel one thing right now and i call it the the two phone call uh problem and that is that after i give a speech i often have students you know call me up and and tell me about their successes in finding a career and it usually ends up with two phone calls if they haven't done the work they need to do. The first phone call is when they call me and say, Jeff, I am so excited. I just got hired to XYZ Corporation. It's amazing. It's going to be the best thing ever. I start on Monday. I am so excited. Yeah, they picked me from the job fair and I know it's going to be great. The second phone call I get, it's about six months later. Same student, now a professional, calls up and says, Jeff, get me out of here. They don't appreciate me, I'm underpaid, nobody's listening, I don't know where I'm going, and I have no idea why I ever thought this job was for me. Well, I gotta tell you, it's not the fault of the organization that's hiring you. It's our fault because we have surrendered in this old process. We have surrendered um, the control of our career to somebody else. We let our career choose us rather than choosing our career. So what do we do to sort of turn that around? What can you do to start to understand where you should work? Because many times students simply don't know what kinds of jobs are out there for them. Let me tell you this, whatever your interest it is, whatever your interest is, whatever your passion is, I guarantee you there is a job out there that will pay you and pay you well uh, to do that interest or passion. And if that's still a mystery, I have a very specific question for you. When you were seven, eight, and nine years old, and you're out in your neighborhood, you know, you're playing with your friends, and all of a sudden your parent or caregiver comes to the door and says, hey, it's getting late, it's time to come inside, right? What were you doing? What were you doing that you could have done all day that you had energy to, to burn because it was the favorite thing for you to do? That is, whatever that thing is, whatever that interest is, you combine that with the skill that you learned as a, as a college student and you put those two things together, that should be your career, right? You take that technical skill that you, you earned and you paid dearly for in your college experience and you combine that with your personal passion. Let me give you two examples. Um, there was a young lady uh, that came to me and she was in pre-med, she was leaving pre-med. She says, you know, this just isn't for me. I'm, I'm really interested in, in medicine, but um, I, I really want to be a salesperson, right? Which is so odd because most people say they never want to be a salesperson and we'll get into that more later. But the, but the bottom line was those were her two criteria. And so after, an, after looking for a few months, we were able to find her a job and today she travels the country with surgical gear, with this like this big chest with has got all this secure, uh, 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 surgical gear and she sells this new surgical gear uh, to, um, to hospitals uh, for their operating room, right? And the weird thing is, though, she actually has to travel with a cadaver, <laughs> right? She told me she travels with just pieces right, of a cadaver because you have to use sure. the surgical gear to do that. So I'm in, just side story, I'm in, the, I'm in New York City at the, at the W Hotel, and the way the W is, you know, you, you people walk in, and the bar and the social area is right out in the open next to registration. So I look over, and there she is. And you know what she's got? She's got that big chest with her. What did I want to know? I wanted to know what's she, in there. What's, what's in there? <laughs> and sure enough, she told me she was traveling with uh, traveling with her cadaver. But but whatever, it's a perfect job for her. She's doing really really well. One other really quick example is there was a young lady who was uh, in horticulture. She was very very interested in botany and biology, and she wanted to travel. Those were her two criteria. Today, she travels the world going into the jungle, right, to find new plants with certain characteristics that can be mass produced produced for the big box chains. She, she uh, labels them, sends them off. She's making tremendous money doing this because nobody else has those skills. See, the thing is, if you match that passion that you have when you're seven, eight, nine years old with the skills you learn when you're in college, you put those two together, that means you're gonna be doing something that you're really interested in because your career isn't today, it isn't a week, it's 
40 years of your life, right? 40 years of your life, day in and day out. And if you want to compete at the top of your game, you're going to need an abundance of energy that isn't going to disappear six months in when you have to make the second phone call to Jeff and say, I hate this place, right? Instead, it's six months. It's like better than it was before. And a year later, it's better than it was. I tell you, I'm 30 years in. I jump out of bed every morning because I love my job. But when I was five, six, and seven, you'd be surprised to know what I was doing. I used to make stages and give speeches. That's a surprise, right? You never <laughs> would have guessed that. Tara, what were you doing? Same story. I was the loudest voice in the neighborhood and I was producing commercials and shows because the VHS camera had just come out. So we were shooting our own productions and then I ended up as a news anchor being able to star in some of them by way of the evening news. So you're well, absolutely I, right. I don't want to put you on the spot, but can you tell the story about the, your, your dad when he bought you the camera and your first interview? It's such a cool that's story. that's perfectly what we were just yes, talking about. Yes. So my hometown of Peoria, Illinois, the home of Richard Pryor, he debuts his show, Jojo Dancer, Your Life is Calling, hosts the movie premiere in his hometown of Peoria, which happened to be my hometown. I'm a fifth grader who now has access to a VHS camera and deck when not many families had one because my father was a school superintendent, so we were able to check out the gear. I had the camera on my shoulder and stood this close to Richard Pryor and covered him talking with reporters as my first official press conference, whereas I ultimately followed years later becoming a journalist as a result of that first taste of what I enjoyed, where I found my passion. I want to leave with one, one thought on this topic, and that is that we spent over 10 years examining what the top one-tenth of one percent of wage earners do differently than everybody else. And, and that became the subject of a series of books that, that were published, and, and it really was sort of groundbreaking work because you'd think it was, oh, they were, uh, you know, the most successful people went to a certain school or had money or whatever the case may be. But what we found was that the most successful people in the world did one thing different than everybody else, right? Actually, it's two pieces, but they did this one thing different than anybody else. They knew what they wanted. They took time to figure out what it is they wanted, and then they were willing to share that with others. And so that is the challenge I give you if you want to uh, go ahead and uh, really take charge of your career as a young person. This is so, so fun. Much. You've given us so much to think about. We want to hear from you. Questions, comments, give us your feedback. Go to jeffkaplan.com where you can actually watch the episode that you're hearing now as well as interact with us. And we'd like to have you ask Jeff a question on a future show. We'll be right back. Are you ready to take charge of your career or for the challenge of franchise ownership? It's time you live it to own it. It's your ultimate guide to franchise selection, operations, and expansion. Look for the franchise guide, Live It to Own It, coming soon from co-authors Jeff Kaplan and Jerry Akers. Every episode of Willing to Win ends with a special segment we call Uplift. It's a chance for Jeff to share a lesson that will really be applicable to your daily life. Well, this week's uh, uplift is uh, something that you can use to improve your personal and professional relationships. And it's really very simple. As you interact with people over this next week, I want to challenge you to, uh, instead of asking what, ask why questions. Instead of asking what, ask why questions. Let me explain how I learned this and how you can apply it. Um, I, was, I had a really tremendous opportunity to work with a, a very large employer. It's one of the largest employers in all of Philadelphia. And I got a chance to travel there and I went up in the building that's got you know their name on the side of it and I was gonna meet with the number three person in the entire organization, a big time executive, right? And you know, he was at the top floor, you know, 38th floor of this building, and I go into his office, his secretary shares with me that he's running late from a prior meeting, and so I'll be there for a few minutes before he shows up. Right, and so I look around on his desk and in his office just to see what kind of person you know he is, and I see the various you know things um, laid out that you might expect to be in an executive's office, and then something caught my eye, and what caught my eye was a little helmet. Right, it was a little replica of an NFL helmet, but it wasn't for the Philadelphia team. It wasn't for the Eagles. Now you have to understand, Philadelphia is probably one of the most rabid sports towns yes. in the country. I actually think there's laws that you have to root for the Flyers and the Eagles, right? So to, to be in one of the largest employers in the area, to be in one of their executives' office, and to see this little helmet that didn't have the Eagles on it, it had the Houston Texans on it. And, and, and this was back when the Houston Texans 
were a brand new expansion team, it definitely caught my eye. Now I had two choices at this point, right? When he came into the office, if I wanted to use uh, the fact that the football helmet was up there to get the conversation started, I could do what a lot of you know uh, guys do. They could say, hey, I like football, you like football? Yeah, right? And that will get us a total of nowhere in terms of really connecting with someone. And that's the what question. I like football, you like football. What do you like? What do I like, right? And that just puts us into categories, but it really doesn't help us connect. Instead, what I'm challenging you to do is to do what I did and change the question from what to why. So instead of saying, I like football, you like football, instead of that, I ask him a better question. I said, wow, you're, you, know, you work for one of the largest employers in Philadelphia, and, and yet you still have this helmet for the Houston Texans up on the shelf. There's got to be a story there. Why is it up there? And that's when everything changed in this brand new relationship. This is the first time that I had met this gentleman. He started to tell me, Jeff, you know what? You're absolutely right. It doesn't have much to do with football at all. You see, in this company, in order to succeed, they, they, they give you training and then they send you to a market and you perform a job, right? And you have to do it really well for about five years. And if you do it really well, they give you a phone call and then you get notified that you're getting a promotion. And that promotion means another market and a different kind of job uh, that's higher up in the, in the pecking order. You, know, you get a promotion, you complete that and you do another move and so on. Now the last place that he had lived before he moved to Philadelphia was Houston, Texas, right? And, and he told me that it wasn't just about being in that city, it was the special uh, experience he had because when he moved there, his son was seven. And when he left, his son was 12. And he goes, Jeff, I don't know if you're a dad, but there's a big difference between seven and 12. See, at seven, I could throw him the football and I would sort of like hit him on the shoulder and roll around. I'd take him to a game and he'd fall asleep in the seats and he wasn't really interested. But by the time he was 12, this kid was designing plays, you know, going out for the long pass. We would get to the stadium an hour early, stay through the whole thing, lose our voice from cheering, and then wait at the end to try to get the players uh, to sign gear. And I said, so so that's the reason the helmet has such a special meaning to you? And he goes, no, 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 wait, Jeff. You see, I got that call. That call that I was getting promoted and we were leaving Houston, right? The first place that had sort of been our home in all those years. And so the van is all packed up and my wife comes out with the box. And, and I said, oh, honey, is this one more box that I need to put onto the van to, to go to, to, to Philadelphia? And she goes, no, no, it's not. It's, it's something I want you to open up and, and take a look at. So I open it up and there's the helmet for the Houston, Texas. And I was, I was mystified, I'm like, what is this? And she goes, honey, we're so proud of you and so happy that you know, you continue to get these promotions and provide for our family. But I want you to take this helmet and put it on your desk as a reminder, because if you take another promotion, you're going alone because I'm done. And so this helmet has nothing to do with football. It was a reminder that his first priority was to his wife and his family. And we ended up doing business together. Uh, but more importantly, for the next five years, he became a mentor uh, to me uh, as a father. And I just want to end by saying, I even asked myself the same question. I'm a Miami Dolphin fan from Los Angeles. Why? Right? Why would anybody <laughs> be a Miami Dolphin fan? And I asked myself why. And I remember the first time I saw the Dolphins play was in the Super Bowl and my, my grandmother was a Sunday school teacher. And the only time she let me out of Sunday school was for me to go in a little room next to the, next to the uh, place where she taught Sunday school. And on a little TV, I saw the Miami Dolphins play. Now, she's not with us anymore. We lost her to cancer um, about 20 years ago. But every time I see the Dolphins take the field, I think of her. And that is the power of asking why instead of what. Thanks so much for that uplifting moment, Jeff. And thank you for joining us for this first episode of Willing to Win. As we've been saying, we really need you to join this conversation. This is a movement because as Jeff has explained, our relationship with work is broken. Go to jeffkaplan.com for this episode and more content so you can be a part of how we can change what's broken.